Great. Uh, I hope um, you can you can hear me. Uh, it, this is a wonderful discussion for me because when I started my research career, if you want to call it that, 16, 15, 16 years ago, it was at a place that unfortunately very recently went bankrupt called IDASA, the Institute for Democracy in South Africa. And one of the very first things, one, one of the very first things I was looking at at the time were the pilots for uh, what later became the Open Budget Index. So some of my colleagues were working on that and produced the first South African paper. So it's a wonderful occasion for me to really step back and think and admire in many ways how far this work has come. I want to do two things. I do want to step back a bit more than Paolo has, has actually done uh, and just point out how unique in many ways the work of the IBP is. I want to then also challenge IBP maybe a little bit in thinking about this m much more broadly than just the develop developing country issue because I, I think this is one of the potentials for this, for this type of research to make a really big splash much more widely than, than amongst kind of people interested in development. I'm completely with you. I'm also uh, very engaged in this area, but I think we can go much further in kind of how ambitious we are in, in pushing this agenda. And then I want to kind of look ahead. So after stepping back, I want to look forward and kind of think think a little bit. You left it on a, on a slightly pe pessimistic note, you, or you were kind of admitting to at least partly, you know, being a bit frustrated by your findings in terms of not knowing what what am I going to go to the organizations with that I'm that that we're working with as IVP. I can't tell them to cause a regime change, uh, you know, things like that, cause an economic crisis. So. so I think uh, I'm just going to put some ideas on the table that, that hopefully will make you, when you come back in five years with the <laughs> next book, you'll be a much more kind of, uh, you, yeah, you'll be maybe happier about your policy implications. One step back f first. So I, I want to really praise IBP because I think it's a very unique product that uh, we've we see kind of coming into fruition in, in this book. So the open budget index is completely unique in my view in, in the entire universe of governance indicators. It's the only measure that is objective, uh, specific to a policy area, f fiscal transparency, budget transparency, r very rigorous in terms of its research, good country researchers, peer reviewed, everything publicly documented about the research process and about editorial decisions. And it's a long-term initiative. It's not one of those one-off things, some researcher concocting an index, banging it out in a nice paper that looks very glossy and then you don't hear anything anymore. Uh, so this is something that's happening in a very systematic, on a very systematic basis. So that combination of objectivity, specificity, the rigorousness of the methodology and, and the research and, and the regularity of it makes it a really unique product. And at the same time, I also think what is highlighted with the book is also unique a bit about IBP, that they are concerned as an organization with doing rigorous research uh, around the, the work that they do. So not only advocacy, but also trying to gather evidence and building an evidence based and recognizing that this ultimately is really crucial in making an impact in the policy world. Without that, we're just, we're just uh, you know, uh, stating hypotheses, I could say provocatively. So getting the evidence to convince people is very, very important. And I think so the quality of the research and this ambition to document impacts and, and, and do research with it is really unique. So let me move on after having praised IVP and, and Paolo to, to starting to criticize a, a little bit in a, in a very gentle way and in a very friendly way because I really, this is fun, yeah, I've said enough about what I think about the organization. I think, so the one thing I would say that this is far, far, far from a developing country issue. So if you look at budget and fiscal transparency, um, the first thing I would observe is that there are very few things that are uh, probably as unambiguously good as fiscal transparency and where I would think uh, you will find as few opponents to enhancing fiscal transparency, certainly at, of 
course, governments may resist it, but if you think about kind of what the case for fiscal transparency is, it's so overwhelming. <coughs> and that's very different to many of the other governance reforms that, that we often encounter. Uh, I think you mentioned some of the, the kind of correlations, if you want. Sometimes we might be able to talk about plausibly causal effects of transparency, but you've, you've gone over those. Uh, uh, fiscal performance, borrowing costs, corruption, uh, all of these impacts have been very extensively documented and they're all impacts that we want to see. Um, let, me, let me highlight, just to make that point about, about where this matters and how much more widely it matters than just in the developing world, to, to, uh, by making the statement that this is possibly the core issue in debates ar around the future of the Eurozone and the European Union at the moment. Um, and this relates to some of my own, own work around this. So uh, a lot of things that went wrong in Europe uh, around the time of the crisis have to do with fiscal transparency, what went wrong in Greece. Uh, and you see a lot of things happening at the European level. For example, the fiscal compact, this new fiscal treaty that EU countries uh, signed up to last year. Uh, have to do with improving the availability of fiscal information. So this is you know, a very widely uh, relevant um, uh, topic. And the countries that are in trouble today in the Eurozone are those that rank at the bottom of fiscal transparency measures, including the Open Budget Index. Uh, so if, if I look at Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, those are also, if you look at the traditional EMU 15, who, uh, the countries that rank very, very lowly. Um, the IMF and the OECD are pushing towards revisions of their codes for fiscal transparency and the, be and the best practices, and some of the topics may be a little different than what we encounter in, in developing countries. Uh, here the focus might be more on fiscal risks uh, contingent liabilities, so if you think about the banking sector and things like that. So the focus is a little bit different. These are not, maybe not necessarily like the big things. We, are, we should be thinking about these things in developing countries as well. But, uh, so slightly different focus, but in terms of substance, it's, we're talking essentially about the same thing. We're talking about budget transparency. So I, I want to challenge IBP also if when you think about the next wave of your research and where you're going with your work. I would say engage more with, with uh, beyond the kind of development community and engage more with European policymakers, national policymakers in developed countries as well because too often we go around, and I'm, I often get annoyed by this, we go around preaching to countries what they should be doing. Uh, I have many examples from my own home country, Germany, where you know, the, uh, we go around telling people, for example, to implement performance budgeting, and then you look at the German federal budget as like one of the best examples of a traditional line item budget. But you know, the German development agency goes around telling people to implement performance budgeting without thinking, why could it be the case that we don't have this thing back home in Germany? So uh, charity starts at home, we should, but also kind of showing good governance starts at home. We should be doing much more about that. And I challenge IBP to, to contribute to that debate. Uh, so my third point is looking forward. So not, uh, not just uh, kind of in, term so in terms of this research and how, how you might develop it. And you gave, gave me, I think, a very, uh, some very good cues, I hope. Um, so one of the most interesting things about what you document is this funnel. And whichever direction, I'm not, let, let, let's return to that in, in, in the discussion. But it's, it's certainly true. Um, I think we wouldn't disagree that you know it's very hard. I, I don't see a linear relationship in this. And then it's, it's not a very, very straightforward thing that's going on. We see countries that in, in vastly improve fiscal transparency, but it doesn't filter directly into participation and accountability. We often aren't even sure you know, how we would capture that and what it would mean. Um, I have a few, state, a few thoughts around that. So in terms of participation, I think there might also be simply natural limits in, in terms of what we can expect. Budgets can be simplified, but there are many things about budgets that are inherently very complex and you, know, you can 
there, there are limits to how much, uh, how simple you can make them, uh, how accessible they will inherently be to non-specialists. If you think about, for example, issues of long-term fiscal projections, assessing fiscal risks and stuff like that. These are really messy things and you have to have a lot of background, technical background to, to tease these things apart. And, um, you know, so they're built in limitations, I think that's one thing. Um, also what I observe a little bit in your research is that there's still very, and I understand of course how, why that is the case, and I, I would have gone in the same direction, but there's a very strong focus on organized uh, civil society, on kind of civil society organizations. Um, and I think transparency has a potential participation relevance at least on a wider set of actors, and these include the parliament, which IBP is also concerned about, but also individual citizens potentially, and I think this might be, that's one, one thing I'll come back to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is one area where I think RBP should think, could do a bit more, could think a bit more. Um, so in order to do that, I think we need to know more about what kind, or what, yeah, what kind of fiscal disclosures increase or widen engagement amongst citizens. Uh, and if we want to do that, uh, I think we need to look, shift one level lower. We, we're looking very much at the moment at the country level, at a very aggregate level. And I think the next wave of research, I would challenge you to think more about impacts on individual citizens. So w what we do need now and what is starting to emerge in some academic areas, I think, is where people start using micro evidence, so they look at impacts on individual citizens in particular areas, uh, and they start to explore how does disclosure of information, fiscal information, actually affect their behavior and what they do, and this could include things like even voting behavior, but it could in include potentially a very wide range of, of uh, other potential impacts on the, on the behavior of actual citizens, as well as service delivery impacts at the, at the very local level. So to sum that point up, I would say shifting down one level to, or shifting down to the micro level may uh, result in you coming back in three, four, five years down the line and being a bit less uh, positive about what the policy implications mean of, even I, of yeah, even more positive. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if you you know you you end it by saying, you know, you can't yeah. tell people to start a revolution. But if we start thinking about, you know, what happens when I give citizens certain type of information and what do they do with it? How does it change their lives? And understanding that better, I think you're going to go away uh, much more kind of um, with, with much more concrete ideas about what it is IBP can do to, to change the world, if you want, in small ways, but important ways.